The committee will come to order. Ms. Jayapal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thank you for being with us. In April 2020, white supremacists stormed the Michigan State Capitol carrying guns, swastikas, Confederate flags, and a doll representing Governor Whitmer with a noose around its neck. Many of us saw those events as a dress rehearsal for the events of January 6th. Did the FBI consider these events in its preparation and intelligence gathering leading up to January 6th? Well, certainly uh, threats in Michigan were something that were very much uh, on our mind. Among other things, we, as you may know, we investigated and took down a ring of domestic terrorists who were attempting to kidnap Governor Whitmer, the so-called Wolverines. Did you consider the events as they relate to the intelligence that you were seeing relative to January 6th? Uh, it's hard for me to say specifically. Uh, certainly it was something that was of, on our mind, uh, and we baked in all the information we had in the intelligence products that we were putting out over the course of 2020 right on up until December, warning about the potential for domestic violent extremism as it relates to the election, continuing past Election Day itself, continuing through into inauguration. Thank you, Director Ray. It isn't just white supremacists as rioters or insurrectionists that we're concerned about. We're also concerned about the infiltration of the ranks of law enforcement, something that you earlier in this hearing called uh, the internal threat, I believe you said, and you said that you were taking it very seriously. Is that correct? Yes, I, did. I think the phrase I used was the insider threat. Insider threat, yes. thank yes. you. But this isn't a new threat. In fact, 15 years ago in 2006, the FBI Counterterrorism Division released an intelligence assessment on white supremacist infiltration of law enforcement. Then in 2015, the FBI Counterterrorism Division's policy directive and policy guide warned agents assigned to domestic terrorism cases that the white supremacist groups that they investigate often have, quote, active links to law enforcement officials. And in February of 2020, a confidential intelligence assessment concluded that white supremacists were very likely to seek affiliation with law enforcement to further their ideologies. The report stated that extremists expressed a desire to join the military and law enforcement primarily to obtain trade craft to prepare for and initiate a collapse of society. Director Ray, are you familiar with these three reports? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with those specific reports, but I'm familiar with in general with the theme that they represent, at least as you've described them. In September of 2020, you testified before the House Homeland Security Committee that, quote, racially motivated violent extremists over recent years have been responsible for the most lethal activity in the United States. Now, the 2020 intelligence assessment specifically highlighted the risk of white supremacists joining law enforcement as a way to engage in violence against the U.S. government and certain racial and ethnic groups, which sounds eerily familiar to what we saw on January 6th. To your knowledge, Director Ray, were there law enforcement officers participating in the January 6th attack on the Capitol? Uh, well, there were a whole variety of types of individuals involved in the January 6th. Were there law enforcement the Capitol? officers? Uh, about to finish my answer. Um, there were, among the many uh, that we have investigated and arrested, there have been current and especially former members of military and law enforcement. And among the things, uh, which I think is where you're going with your question, uh, that we're doing and have been doing for a while now is working through our Joint Terrorism Task Forces, which often have representatives of both the military and uh, various police departments, law enforcement departments. Uh, so we work closely with them because we're obviously particularly concerned about anybody engaged in domestic terrorism, but especially somebody who might be in a position of trust and responsibility, like a member of law enforcement or military. We have all kinds of engagement with DOD, for example, to try to help Let me keep out. going because yes. I, I want to get to a couple yeah. of specific questions. An independent journalist actually documented at least 45 law enforcement officials in attendance on January 6th that have been publicly reported. And since 2000, law enforcement officials with alleged connections to white supremacist groups or far-right militant activities were exposed in 14 states and hundreds of federal, state, and local law enforcement officials were exposed participating in racist, nativist, and sexist social media activity. Has the FBI under your leadership, and maybe you were getting to some of these specific points, distributed guidance to state and local local law enforcement to assist them in weeding out white supremacist officers? We have engaged with our partners about better 
identifying domestic violent extremism, including in particular uh, giving them information about things like symbology, tattoos, you know, that kind of thing, things to be sort of on the lookout for that may be indicators of individuals who have mobilized to violent extremism. Uh, and that is something that we have tried to put out intelligence products and uh, as you mentioned, but then others as well. Uh, and we've done a lot of training and engagement with our partners on some of these topics. My right. time has expired, but I, I was hoping that you could provide us with uh, specific, you know, specific steps that you've taken to ensure that we are weeding out these white supremacists within local law enforcement. So perhaps we can get a briefing on some of those specific things you're doing, including collecting statistics uh, on white supremacist affiliation with local law enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Christopher Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, and I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm -hmm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media.
When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.